Good evening, Malaysia, Australia, Hong Kong, and followers from around the world. Our guest for tonight is Dr. Helmi Haja Maidin. He specializes in internal and respiratory medicine. Dr. Helmi is a graduate of Newcastle University. He, he was an associate professor at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. His area of interest includes asthma and smoking-related lung diseases. Okay, as we now enter into the second week of the lockdown, the number of stage four and stage five COVID patients have increased in Malaysia. When we talk about stage four and stage five, we're talking about those who require oxygen and ventilators. Now, uh, Dr. Helmi, welcome on board. Uh, maybe you can take us through these uh, stages. Uh, what do we start off with? And at what point where the patient needs uh, lung uh, treatment and oxygen and respiratory uh, ventilators? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, so you mentioned stage four or rather category four, category five. So there are five categories. Category one is when a patient has COVID-19 on board. So the PCR mm -hmm. test is positive, but there are no symptoms. Category two yeah. is when you have mild symptoms. You're talking about your cold-like symptoms, a fever, body ache, maybe you can't smell anything. Sometimes you may have a bit of a stomach ache or diarrhea. So very general, very non-specific symptoms. Now, once you go into category three, you're starting to become a little bit more serious because category three is when you have pneumonia. You've got changes on your chest x-ray, which means there is some involvement of the lungs. So category four is when the lungs are so affected that your oxygen levels start to drop. And as a result, you need extra oxygen. So people who use like the nasal prong or the oxygen mask, those are category four. And then category five is the most serious where despite using oxygen, things get worse. And unfortunately, you reach a stage where you are in ICU or the intensive care unit, and you may not only need a ventilator, but you may need other ways of supporting the various organs that may begin to fail. As you pointed out, we are reaching a point where there are higher levels of category four, category five patients, which also means that we are needing more and more beds in the intensive care units and more and more ventilators. And this is where there's an issue with capacity because there's only ever a fixed amount of ventilators in a particular country and a mm -hmm. fixed number of doctors and healthcare workers who are specialists in that field. That's why we're seeing increasing numbers of deaths why we are seeing increasing numbers of very severe cases. When we talk about COVID-19, obviously that uh, COVID-19 is a virus that actually attacks the lungs. So in short, that uh, this is the uh, the point where where what do you call it the uh, the virus actually hits you the most, right? So your it's something that's transmitted through your airways. It's something that affects your airways, and ultimately, when people do poorly. Even if they survive, one of the organs that, are, that is most hit is the lungs. Now, you once again have to bear in mind that for the vast majority of people, we're talking at least two thirds of people, you may not feel anything. There are plenty of people going out there who don't have symptoms, for example, who are category one. And these, unfortunately, are people who may transmit things once again through droplets, you know, when you're coughing, when you're yeah. talking to people, when you're laughing, when you're sharing a meal. That's where all these SOPs come into place. And that's why all the SOPs are about distancing. You want to get yourself away from people who may be passing stuff to you. You want to mask up because you want to reduce the possibility of passing it on to people. And of course, you want a well-ventilated area where there isn't any issues with regards to the virus floating in nearby. And this is where, once again, it's all about protecting your airways. And you pointed it out, if you have someone who has got a virus in the body, the lungs are the ones that become inflamed. And with the increasing levels of inflammation, the levels of oxygenation or the oxygen level that your body is able to take in drops. And this is where it becomes dangerous. A year back, when we had our first uh, MCO1, and then that uh, there was the beginning of the uh, COVID-19 uh, situation, um, at that point, most of the uh, patients who were affected were people uh, in their sort of like 50s, 60s. You know? uh, they had diabetic problems. They had all kinds of uh, sicknesses. And of course, uh, they accumulated and they fall sick. But um, the latest figures were to show that people in their 30 and their 40, uh, they're actually uh, increasing. According to the data from the Crisis Preparedness and Response Center, it says that younger people between 20 and 40 
have been infected most by the wave this time. Okay, now, uh, this group of people who are 20 and 40 young people, otherwise were healthy, um, would they have the kind of same situation where their lungs would be uh, hit as well? It's, it's a combination of factors. I think one, there is the issue of capacity. One, there's the issue of variants as well. So for example, one of the latest variants, the Delta variants, it's far more easy for it to be transmitted to people. So rather than maybe passing it from one person to another, one person can maybe pass it on to 10 people. So you can imagine how the numbers go up in society or in the community. Now, when the numbers go up, it also means there'll be more and more people who may require medical attention. And these are people that perhaps if the capacity is stretched, may not get medical treatment or medical attention at the right time. One year ago, if there were 50 people with COVID-19, those 50 people would be monitored closely. You know, you have lots of doctors, you may even put all of them in ICU and you'll be able to keep an eye on them and, you know, address things accordingly. But now, if you have people with COVID-19, you may have difficulty even getting admitted to a normal ward, depending on where you live. And most circumstances, you'd want someone who is category one or two to self-isolate or self-quarantine at home. The, the basic rules are still the same. The people who are at the highest risk are people who are more elderly, we're talking about 50 and above, and people with certain comorbidities or chronic diseases, particularly diabetes, chronic renal failure, cardiac, uh, or rather chronic cardiac failure, and obesity. Now, if you look at our Malaysian population, unfortunately, there's a very high level of diabetes. There's a very high level of being overweight, of being obese. So even people who may appear to be normal, but perhaps are overweight, they may have a poorer outcome. And this applies to ages across the board and not just to the elderly. Yeah, I think that the same situation arises in India, uh, in Malaysia. We are supposed that it's our uh, uh, eating habits, you know, the um, the uh, consumption of rice, yeah, rice, data rate, yes. sugar levels, yeah, and kue, you know. So uh, the, the similarity there is uh, quite near. In, in India, I, I believe that from my, what I read, diabetes is a big concern for the uh, big rise in COVID now. Uh, I just want you mentioned just now about um, um what I call it the quarantine. Now, um, you know, I have hear a lot of stories for many uh, B40 category, uh, low-income people who live in a low-cost flat, you know, uh, two rooms, sometimes even one room, okay, and that they have a big uh, family. Now, uh, in situations like this, you know, um, uh, how do people actually uh, practice social distancing or even to, to be quarantined uh, when you have a big family with only two rooms in a low-cost house? It is, it is very difficult and that's why a lot of people would say that things like a pandemic are very much a social economic crisis and not just a public health crisis. Just as yeah. there is difficulty in terms of finding the right social distancing or the right physical distancing, these are the very same individuals who will be most affected by a lockdown because of issues of income and revenue. And this once again is where a, an appropriate policy whereby targeted assistance is given to those who are particularly affected by a lockdown would be most helpful. And this goes beyond your, you know, beyond respiratory medicine, right? We're talking a little bit more about social economic policies, about identifying people who may be able to, well, who are not able rather to survive a pandemic, let alone a lockdown. And these are the individuals that the appropriate agencies, the appropriate ministry should take them out from where they are temporarily house them or temporarily keep them in facilities that once again can be reconvened yeah. into for other purposes and these are also the individuals who may benefit from cash handouts or other forms of subsidies that will allow them to go back to being economically productive when the time comes. Dr. Helmi, you know that we mentioned about diabetes, you know? Now, um, are people with chronic heart and blood diseases more at risk? Uh, compared to others your when you talk about blood diseases you're talking about something that may be going wrong with your your yeah. blood system right so it could range from things like having abnormal clotting all the way to having a form of cancer like leukemia so depending on what it is some of it may predispose you to higher complication rates but once again depends on what it is the thing that um a lot of people have asked about when it comes to clotting is actually to do with vaccines because there are some news going around how certain vaccines may predispose you to having higher levels of blood clots. And this is where a lot of people are starting to look very closely at their own medical history and getting their own medical checkups to make sure that their clotting levels are okay prior to getting a vaccine. I want to mention a specific case, okay? Uh, 
after this we will play the uh, video okay. the video clip okay essentially this is a case of the dato michael chong the famous mr oh, yes, Fixit, okay? yes. <laughs> uh, i mean the mca uh, public complaints uh, and services uh, bureau chief okay in his case okay he was uh, admitted into hospital in december 31st last year okay. um, on the eighth day the oxygen level fell and his lungs in his overs couldn't take it anymore and the uh, doctors actually uh, was overheard telling us others that look his chances are really 50 mm -hmm. 50 now but he, he it took him a month to actually fight uh, covid uh, and he was discharged uh, one month later but he was admitted to hospital again a couple of days later uh, to repair his uh, damage um okay we shall now uh, watch this video was that us liu hao ah december 12 hao wo jiu gen ni ban pai pai you ah wo men qi yi ge fang shen la er shi ge li men ah yi jing shi ba ge ah zhe zhong dao zhe ge wei wo zai zhe ge san shi hao wo jiu jie ding okay la bu ru qi test kan la san shi yi hao 下午，我就收到个电话，他说啊，大志聪，啊、uh, ，your test result came out and you are positive of COVID。那么医生有跟我说了 ，stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, stage five。我是 step four， 因为我有那个 medical 那个 history， 有糖尿病，有血压高，还有我的 kidney 啊，也不是很好。在那个一月一号那时候，他就 observe 我，看我的情况怎么。样。The seven day 晚上的时候，他出来，那时候就 attack 我的了。那时候呼吸很困难。Chinese one 啊，他就很 direct。Your condition is not very good. Okay, we have to put you into ICU to pump oxygen for you. 如果你的 oxygen 可以 maintain 可以什么啊 ？Maybe you got fifty percent chances. 我的手啊，全部啊。放那个那个丢，这个右手他放那些 antibiotic， 左手他放那些 supplement 啊，水啊那些，这边又放很多那些玩意儿。我拍的时候很想啊，拔出来就算了了，不可以吃东西的，因为你 once you in in the ICU 啊，你没有东西吃的话，你要喝水啊，水啊都没有，我看 injection 啊，包括肚子。四百只 ，four hundred injection。二十八号，差不多一个月啊，我就去验，去了验，我就去一个 rehab 诊了。医生跟我讲，他说，你虽然你是好了，你没有可谓了，但是你要知道啊，他那个 after effect 啊，他弄到你的肺啊。还有其他你要去在，最好他就推荐我去一个私人医院咯。他说：“你这个口鼻症，我们不敢怎么样讲啊。虽然你没有口味，但是你的浪啊，很像很 weak 浪哦。”就传说我去这个啊、呃、三月，我在三月住了十一天。我出院的时候啊，是还有两天就新年了。到现在啊，我还是你看。还是要用这个东西，虽然我的肺啊 OK， 但是啊，它也影响到我的脚，是我的热啊，给它影响到。现在我走的时候啊，我的力脚啊要要要要要拉上来了，所以啊，有很多啊，以为啊出了院没有东西，其实医生跟我说，出了院啊不是这样简单，还要去照顾我。最怕好像我们老一辈了，啊，就很麻烦。怎么样都好了啊 ，prevention is better than cure 了。嗯、um, ，What is this a rehabilitation therapy for lungs? Why is it necessary after you have been 
well, like, when you call it, you have a, been discharged from hospital, it says that those people who have actually been discharged are never the same again. Is that correct? I, I wouldn't say it applies for everyone because for a large number of people, they, they do go back to normal life. It's a question of how quickly and to what degree, but you're absolutely right. There are those who range from being dependent on oxygen all the way to people who, as they continue with rehab, as they get better, they continue to move towards having a normal life. Now, I'll take a step back, actually, and maybe rewind a little bit. You mentioned how on day eight, he deteriorated, the oxygen requirements increased. That's fairly typical. If you if you recall, when it comes to quarantine, we're talking about someone being kept for a period of 14 days. So even in hospital, you're looking at someone over a period of 14 days. That 14 days is important for two reasons. One, the infectivity. So you're still potentially contagious and you don't want someone to go out passing the germ or the virus around whilst that person is still, still contagious. Secondly, in a lot of cases, perhaps similarly with um, Dr. Michael's case, you're talking about a situation where for the first week or so, things are quite stable. You may have a bit of a fever and whatnot. And then when you hit day eight, nine, 10, suddenly the inflammation goes up. There's something called a cytokine storm where the lungs and the body as well becomes very inflamed. So it becomes very bunk up, you know, very swollen. Yeah. And as a result of that, the oxygen drops. And how people respond, how people behave depends very much on the individual. Some people go home with no residual damage whatsoever. They go back to normal. Some people develop some form of fibrosis, which is essentially scarring. And some people, because they have stayed in hospital for so long, start to lose the strength of their muscles, their arms, their legs become weak. And as a consequence, like you mentioned, you need rehab, not just for the lungs itself, but the body. It's like being hit by a car. You know, you have a really nasty accident. You have got your body broken in many ways. And then it takes time. It takes, it takes physio, it takes rehab for you to build things up again before you can go running again. It's the same thing. The virus is that bad accident that's hit your lungs. But the consequences of that accident, the consequences of that virus takes much longer to improve and you need this rehab to get things better. A year back, uh, we merely looked at uh, COVID-19 patients as mere statistics. And then that uh, year later, we found that how strong and aggressive the virus has been attacking people, especially the lungs. I mean, I've uh, lost a couple of friends. Okay. I'm like, one week ago, they were admitted and two weeks later or 10 days later, they're gone, okay? And the story is always the same. I cannot breathe anymore. Uh, there was one person who actually had, uh, he, he fell down, he had a fall, you know, because he had problem breathing. Um, and then he was admitted to the hospital and soon he, he passed away. And the same story that uh, it's always the lungs, you know, I, I cannot breathe anymore. So the, 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 uh, the level of attack this time is really, very, really, very really strong. Why is it that this time compared to a year ago that the attack on the lungs have been particularly so aggressive? It's the sheer numbers. So like you mentioned, one year ago, you're talking about something you read in a paper or on social media, you yeah. see photographs of people, you think, oh yeah, that's happening, but it's not something that's connected to you. I think we've reached a stage where all of us, we may know it, maybe just one degree of separation or at most two degrees of separation of people who've been affected. Either they've tested positive, they've had a close scare, Perhaps they have been admitted to hospital or, you know, we have all, we have lost something to lose friends and loved ones as well. And the impact is far more than just the numbers. We're talking about the impact in terms of people losing lives, families losing breadwinners, families being affected. I've met families where, you know, a total of 14 or 15 of them were all tested positive and not all survived. Oh, sorry, 14 to 15 of them in the family? Yes, yes there, have, oh. there have been situations like that. Oh, and uh, of varying degrees of severity. So some had no symptoms whatsoever. Some unfortunately passed on. And you can, you can imagine the impact on such families and how much they would suffer physically, but just as importantly, mentally. And one thing that I feel hasn't been talked about as much is the mental health effects of this pandemic on us, both in terms of people who suffer from it, the people who suffer directly as a consequence, but even as a nation, you know, the fact that we are, away, we are back home, we are becoming more lonely, more depressed, more angry, more frustrated. There's, I think, a tremendous amount of impact, not just physically, but psychologically as well. I want to share with you another story, which I heard just a week ago uh, in my interview with a pediatrician mm -hmm. and a gynecologist. Um, so there was this uh, a baby that just been delivered, okay? And of course, the baby uh, went home. And that, of course, uh, we, we live in a family, we live in an atmosphere with a lot of family members. And of course, this baby 
negative was soon positive because the grandmother, the uncle, mm. the, everybody came to hug the baby, kiss the baby. They were passing the disease onto the baby. It was really terrible. So you can imagine that, uh, I mean, there are a lot of Malaysians, uh, some of some Malaysians are not taking this uh, too seriously. They, they assume that, well, okay, I'll just go out, you know, I, I got this disease because I met a colleague, you know, I got it from somebody around, but, but uh, they never assume that it can come from a family member yes. and or a very close friend. And I think that's why sometimes, especially with um, festivals, so Chinese New Year, more recently, Hari Raya, you tend to let your guard down a little bit when it's your close to your loved ones, right? Whether it's your, your cousins or your uncles and aunties, your grandparents, because you think, oh, we can we can go be up close and you it's almost an instinctive thing right you want to salam you want to hug yeah. kiss but i also know of people who have not kissed or hugged their grandchildren for months because they're waiting for the right time they're waiting to be vaccinated they want to be protected before they feel that it's safe to do so and you're absolutely right it's it's i think it's a combination of perhaps not being careful enough but in many ways it's also some degree of fatigue you tend to let your guard down after some time because you're just yes. so fatigued about things that you know mistakes start to happen and this is where it becomes a bit dangerous but it is also where the importance of having shows like this is very much um highlighted because it means that we're reminding people of all these important things and we're sharing stories of how things can go wrong but also how things can be done right so when they talk about repairing your lung, what do they do as a specialist, as a lung specialist? What do you do? Now, if it's all scars, right? If it's like scar tissue in the lungs, there's actually not much you can do to reverse the process. It's like a scar on your skin. Once there's a scar there, you can't do anything and you can do surgery and things, but actually the surgery might make the scar worse. Now, imagine if the bulk of your lungs are scarred then you may actually have a situation where the bulk of your lungs are not working anymore. Now, in some countries, they've started to look into the possibility of doing lung transplants for such patients. But this is something that's very rarely done and something that is not easily available in Malaysia. So instead, what you do is you optimize everything else, whatever is left of your lungs, whatever is left of your body, you want to optimize because we have to remember that when it comes to breathing, when it comes to doing things, it's not only the lungs that are the main organ. You have to make sure your heart's doing well. You have to make sure your sugar level's under control to build up the muscles. So this is where the physio comes into play, the rehab comes into play, where eating properly is important, where having the right weight is important, using inhalers if necessary is important. And what you'll notice is nothing I've said is rocket science or something that's brand new. It's all things that unfortunately is very mundane, but once again, equally important because ultimately together, when they work synergistically or holistically, it's about improving your stamina and improving your overall health. What's the worst case that you have come across since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic broke out on the attack on the lungs? I, would, I mean, that would be the worst. Um, so unfortunately, unfortunately, I've treated a number of patients and of, of these number of patients, there have been those who did not survive. And it's very, it's very depressing. Um, it's, it's very sad because sometimes you think that these things are avoidable because mm -hmm. You know, once again, it's it's a uh, it's an infectious disease. So it's something that could have been avoided, perhaps with vaccines or with you know a different circumstance. But then at the same time, what's also depressing is seeing how people die because they die alone. They because once again, it's potentially contagious. Yeah. Families can't visit funerals, which sometimes, yeah. if you think about it, it's not for the dead. It's for the living, right? It's for us to mourn. It's yes. for us to grieve. It's for us to yes. celebrate the individuals. We can't even do that yeah. anymore because yeah. of all the risk involved. So I think that's that's what hits me the hardest. It's not a normal death. People die, Correct. but they die quite lonely, uh, in a very lonely way sometimes. I went to uh, pay my respect uh, to someone who passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to a wake. Uh, it was my first uh, COVID-19, uh, I mean, I've heard of uh, stories, you know, of uh, you had to, you have to be cremated for non-Muslims, you know, you're cremated immediately, that's it, you know, mm. uh, the ashes was there in an urn. I was like, uh, no, I didn't know what to do, uh, how to pay my respect. I asked uh, some silly question, what do we do, when's the funeral? They say, there's no funeral, okay, mm -hmm. that's it, no funeral. So they're going to uh, take the uh, 
earn back, whether to keep it somewhere or dispose the ashes. That's, that's how terrible it is. And of course, uh, very few people dare do turn up, even for the rate yeah, services. Yeah. Uh, despite the number of people that's restricted, but actually very few people turn up. Okay, People were just scared. Of course. Okay? Yeah. yeah, so uh, now, you mentioned the lungs being scarred. Okay, you have been an advocate against smoking. You have been consistently strong. Now, um, I'm trying to understand as a layman, uh, a scarred lungs. Is this like someone uh, who is a heavy smoker, the whole lung is black, you know? Is there any difference between that and the uh, uh, scarred lungs? The type of scarring that you can get from COVID, the fibrosis, is different from the type of scarring that you may get from uh, smoking. Because scar as a word is, it could mean many, many different things. But if we look at it from a medical or pathological point of view, the lungs can be damaged in many ways. You can have something called emphysema, where the walls of the lungs don't hold up so well, they become weaker. You may have this fibrosis where normal lung tissue is replaced by something very rigid, which doesn't allow the lungs to work or expand very well. You may have a situation in smokers where the cilia, this tiny hair on the airways that allow or help us get rid of germs and dirt and stuff, and that doesn't work very well in people who smoke. So these are all factors that can affect the ability for the lungs to function well. And of course, down the line, you may have situations where the cells of the lungs mutate, which then eventually lead to lung cancer. So there are many ways in which the a smoker can be affected. But if the underlying function of your lungs is not good, it then disadvantages you when it comes to dealing with any infection. One, the infection may actually be more difficult to get rid of. Two, if you reach a stage where you need to be, let's say, intubated, you need to be put on a ventilator. Now, whether or not a ventilator works for the patient sometimes depends on the underlying function. So if someone has got pretty bad lung function in the first place, he or she is not going to do well on a ventilator. And in many circumstances, if the lung function is very poor to begin with, we don't even go for the ventilator because we know it's not going to work and we just keep the patient comfortable. So mm. your underlying condition always has an impact on how you survive a particular disease. So in, in other words, uh, the fight against uh, the COVID-19 attack, uh, I mean, where the lungs has been attacked, if I'm a heavy smoker, that my lungs is already actually uh, damaged, you know, whether it's uh, vaping, whether it's uh, shisha or just plain cigarette, the fight would be tougher, right? It would be, it would be. And I think it was Public Health England, I think, who recently came up with a statement reminding us that more people are still dying every year because of tobacco smoke than COVID-19. So that's something that is ongoing in the background and something that we must always be mindful of. Definitely non non essential. <laughs> Definitely non essential. Exactly. That's uh, yeah, whole different conversation there. <laughs> okay, now, so how does one? Okay, uh, what's the best way to strengthen your lungs? Exercise. Actually, yeah, exercise is the best thing. It's a combination. So one, you want to improve your own internal function. So exercising, especially cardiovascular exercises. So things like running, brisk walking, swimming, those are good things. Then you'll even things that expand your lungs, expand your airway. So I always tell, especially my elderly patients who are recovering, things like Tai Chi, yoga, those are helpful as well because you're breathing and you're making your lungs work in ways that you may not do when you're just sitting there passively. Now, of course, the other things that you can do to help your lungs is to eat well. You want to lose weight because any extra weight is an extra burden. You also want to protect your lungs in terms of the uh, various vaccines that are available. So besides the COVID-19 vaccine, there's vaccines against influenza, against pneumococcal disease. These are things to bear in mind. And of course, last but not least, your environments, because just as many people are being affected and do die from air pollution, and this is both indoor and outdoor. It's very difficult because it's if let's say you're someone who is stuck indoors in a condo all the time, then you're not really exposing yourself to very healthy air. You may be breathing in stuff from your air conditioning. You may be breathing in dust and things like that. So proper ventilation is very important. And it's a combination, once again, of improving what's internal, but also ensuring that your environment is friendly and healthy for your lungs. I want to take a step back, okay? Um, because you mentioned the pneumonia earlier, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, when we talk about pneumonia, it is another form of uh, what I call it sickness where you have a problem breathing. Is that correct? So a pneumonia is usually referred to a particular finding that you find on a chest x-ray. So if I want to do a chest x-ray and let's say I've got this typical white spot, 
then it can be labeled as pneumonia. But what causes the pneumonia is a different story. So typically, it's related to a bacterial infection. We have that patch, you look at it and you think, haha, there's an infection, but it could be due to a bacteria. It could be due to TB, for example, could be, but now once again, we're talking about COVID, it could be due to a virus. So that white patches that we mentioned in category three, that's referring usually to pneumonic patches. And these are once again, due to a process that is triggered by infection. But in some cases, a pneumonia may actually even be a presenting feature of cancer. So pneumonia is really a finding, a, a finding that you see on imaging, but what causes it is a different matter. But it is one of the symptoms for COVID-19 in one of the stages. It is one of the findings that you can find and it's in category three onwards. I had a friend who was admitted to hospital. Um, he fought against COVID-19 for maybe 10 days. Okay. okay. And then uh, he sent me a message to say that. I said, how are you doing? He said, not so good. New all kinds of complications. Now I got pneumonia. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, that was a happy ending. He, he has a check out and he's healthy. That's great. Now, okay. now we, we're still on the subject of uh, lungs. Okay. Now, um, so we have all kinds of variants now. We have the, uh, what do you call it? The Indian and the South African variant. Okay. Whatever name we call them. Okay. Now, the question here is, in all these uh, variants, the com would it be correct to say that the common cause and attack will always be the lungs? Is that the primary uh, issue? So the way the virus communicates or interacts with human beings is still the same. It's just that there are certain changes that allow them to be perhaps more contagious. And in some cases, there is also concern they may be more virulent, they may be more dangerous to us. But the manner in which it goes around is the same. The manner in which we approach it is still the same. The manner in which we treat is still the same. Just as importantly, it would appear that the vaccines that we have are still working and it will help protect us against the more complicated category four, category five complications of having these viruses. I also want to understand uh, your specialty a bit uh, in the fight against the COVID-19 okay. because that uh, if someone is admitted in the hospital or any of the quarantine center, okay, um, so uh, I mean, there are so many complications, okay. Um, would the first step be someone uh, who is a GP, you know, and uh, would how many kind of specialists actually will be involved? Uh, in the, the treatment of a patient, okay, because uh, there's a lung issue, mm -hmm. there are all kinds mm -hmm. of these sicknesses, okay. So uh, just take me through the the the, the journey, okay. Uh, when does it start, and then before it comes to the lungs uh, treatment, it it depends very much on how you present and what affects you. So let's say, let's pretend I'm a patient, right? I have a yeah. fever. I go to my GP. My GP says, hey, it's pandemic time. You've got a fever. Let's get yourself tested. I get myself tested, the PCR is positive. What do I do? I self-isolate at home with all the right advice and all the right guidance from maybe the doctor, maybe from the Ministry of Health. Then I monitor myself and then I find maybe day seven, day eight, my breathing is a bit more heavy. I feel that there is some degree of difficulty and I get myself seen by the GP again, but the GP says, you know what? It's day eight, you're breathless. Don't waste time, go straight to the hospital. Then I go to the emergency department. Now, in the emergency department, there is the emergency physician, there are nurses, there are hospital assistants, there are people who are like, um, frontliners who are taking blood off you. Now, that's just what you see, but in the back end, you've got you know the labs and all that as well. Then you get admitted. You get admitted, the radiologist looks at your chest x-ray and says, this guy looks like he's got changes of pneumonia. Why don't we do a CT scan? So already you're talking about an ED physician, you're talking about radiologists, you're talking about all the other healthcare workers. Now, if things are not too bad, then maybe a general physician may be dealing with the patient at that point in time. If you have the facilities, it may be an infectious disease consultant, or it may be a respiratory physician because you're already at category three or four where the lungs are involved and when there is oxygen required. Then if let's say things were to get worse and I end up in ICU, then there'll be an intensive care specialist as well. An intensive care specialist will be supported by intensive care nurses. And if let's say the lungs start to fail or the oxygen is not enough, my kidneys might start to fail, I might need dialysis. So in comes the renal physician, my heart may start to struggle. I may start to have funny rhythms to my heart. Then the cardiologist will be involved as well. So you can see how complicated things can be and how once again, just because there is a ventilator, it doesn't mean you have the ICU type care because it involves such a huge amount of expertise and it's like, you know, cooking many things on a stove. Certain things may overflow, certain things may not, and you need someone to keep an eye on everything to make sure things are fine. So to go back to your initial question, it depends on how complicated 
a presentation you are. And I think just as importantly, where you're presenting to. Because if you live in Klang Valley, then you perhaps have much better access to ICU level care versus somewhere in the rural areas of East Malaysia, for example. We, when we talk about uh, those that have been um, killed by the virus, okay, people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s, okay, uh, what about cases of uh, kids, children uh, who has passed away? Uh, were, were they also affected by a lungs issue? So the, I would say that we must uh, remind ourselves that children are surprisingly resilient. So the vast majority of children, they do well. They appear to suffer from like sniffles, you know, maybe a bit of a fever, but they do very well. And the ones who tend to have done poorly usually have some underlying disease. So cancer, for example, or they were in chemotherapy. So something that had made them have a lesser level of immunity. So in that sense, parents sometimes are very worried about how their kids get the virus. But to me, for children, I'm not too worried about. What's more important from a pediatric or children point of view is when you get the virus, you're a vector. You can pass it on to grandma, pass it on to grandpa, pass it on to mom and dad. And that's more important. Um, once again, ultimately, the manner in which things are transmitted, the manner in which what organs are affected is the same. It's just that, once again, it's like, kids, when they get other viruses, they have a much better adaptation to it and they shrug it off far better than adults. Okay, Dr. Hamid, we're going to wrap it up yeah. now. As Malaysia continues the fight against the virus, what is your last message to Malaysians who are watching this program? Well, I would say for the moment, bear with all the restrictions because the idea is to bring numbers down. We need to protect ourselves in the long term. This is where vaccinations are very important look into what vaccines work, take whatever's available in the first instance. And what we hope to see is as time goes by, we may not go back to normal, but at least there'll be some semblance of normality in terms of movement and interaction. And yeah, th and thank you for doing this because like I said, it's important to keep repeating these messages to keep reminding people of what's important and what they can do to help themselves. Thank you, Dr. Helmi. Thank you, Dr. Um, not, should, not just should Malaysians stay safe, but doctors like you, please stay safe and take care of yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. You have got to interact with a lot of uh, patients who are positive. Indeed. Okay. Now, um, uh, thank you, uh, Malaysia, for watching this. Please follow, share, and uh, follow Dr. Helmi and Real Chun Wai on social media. Thank you. Good night. Good night.